Welcome to the Living Ageless and Bold podcast. Each episode, I bring you amazing women who inspire, educate, and share their experiences and journeys along the way. So grab a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's relax and have some fun hearing what can be accomplished after 55. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode. We're going to have so much fun today. My guest is Bonnie Stevens. She has been a journalist for four decades. I'm sure she has some amazing stories to share with us. And now in her next chapter, she is a speaker. She is an international bestselling author. She's a PR consultant, and she works with women to really pull out, she calls it the story, soul, and style of their lives, which is what she learned from being a journalist for so long. So welcome, Bonnie. Hi, thanks so much. It's so good to be here. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. So four decades as a journalist. Yeah. How let's talk a little bit. I, I always like to to lead up to where we are today, but that must have been a fascinating career. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I think the best thing about it was every day you had no idea what you'd be doing, who you'd be talking to, where you'd be going. And, you know, in, in every event, you always felt like you had a front row ticket to everything that was happening. So it is a wonderful career. It's so exciting. It's high energy, uh, very unexpected. And the people that you get to meet is just incredible. I've interviewed celebrities and four men who have walked on the moon, four U.S. presidential candidates, um, a world-class athletes and explorers and scientists. And so it's hard not to be inspired every single time you go out on a story because I always felt like I was that kid at camp that could tag along with all the cool kids, you know, and see what their oh. best day was. <laughs> and, and that has never changed. And it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's a wonderful career. So yeah, it's been very exciting. I've loved it. I knew I was a writer since I was five years old and I didn't know what a journalist was, but, um, got my degree in journalism and have never looked back and loved every second of it. And you have won an Emmy, so I know that you've done things on TV. Were you also a print journalist? Yeah, well, I started in television news, and that's really okay. my love. Um, absolutely enjoy it. I love that television brings so much. It, it, it ignites all the senses. You feel like you're taking people right out of their living room into your world. And it's just so alive and so exciting. You bring, you know, the audio and the visuals and, and everything about it. And it's so unpredictable, which is also exciting. You've got to have the right personality for, you know, staying on your toes. And, and if something's starting to fail, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I, I gained a great respect in television news for how much you can get done in 10 seconds and how everything, a situation can change that quickly. So, you know, it uh, made me really fast at what I do. It made me fast at moving, getting things done with intention and a great training ground. I started in Phoenix, which is, um, you know, a top market and very intimidating with the kinds of prof professionals I was working with right out of college. And uh, I really... Uh, I, I really think everyone should work in a big market for a big company, for a big organization, at least a few years just to absorb what a professional does, not just the job, but see people in action, being at their best, being at the top of their game. And it takes you to want to be at that level right away and exposes you to it. Right. That's exciting. So were you in Phoenix your whole career? No, I was in Phoenix. It's, right. it's kind of funny, Christina, not funny, but interesting in that um, I was very impressionable. I was 21 when I started my job. At 22, the station, and I was working this night, um, was held hostage by a gunman. And this was in 1982. So this wasn't a normal thing. You know, I mean, now we've kind of become numb to people showing up with guns and, you know, behaving badly. But uh, at this time, it was never expected. And I call it the night Phoenix learned it was a big city because after this event, which went on for five hours, um, you can, anyone can Google it. 
our, our anchorman, Bill Close, was um, really the target. The gunman came in and he was mentally ill. And, you know, I mean, you, you have to comp- have compassion for that. He he started grabbing individuals, you know, co-workers and held one of them through the whole night behind our anchorman right in front of the cameras with a gun to his head. And we, we were, of course, had monitors all across lining the newsroom. So you could not escape this image. It was just everywhere. And we were all terrified. And, you know, at that time, um, and still to this day, that anchorman, Bill Close, was my hero. He had the voice of God. And in that night, I, I'm trying not to get emotional about it because I can take myself right back to it. But in that night, he really saved lives. And it was his ability. You know, he treated him like a news source. He you know, was really cordial with him. He called him uh, Joe and he put his arm around him and he said, you look like an athlete. Tell me about your high school. And, and, you know, I mean, just conversations to sort of take the weirdness out of it. And he was so steady and so calm and so genuine and charming. And of course we had, you know, word got out. We had every news person in the area, plus some from national news and everyone, I'll never forget this. We're sitting in our newsroom as we were working. They were all sitting like a bunch of kindergartners, you know, just sitting or just sitting, staring. Uh, our, our news leadership brought out a monitor so that they could see what was going on. I mean, they really helped everybody get the story that was happening right in our home, basically. And our other anchor who was co-anchoring, it was a situation where one was in the studio and one was in the newsroom. Her name is Mary Jo West. And she was incredible because she just was so composed. And we went through the whole five o'clock news without saying a word about what was happening. And she would get up in the middle of the newscast and, you know, at the commercial break, and she would sweetly say, we'll be right back with this story about something completely different. And she she was also um, pushing herself. She was doing a story about women cops. And so she was going through boot camp the same week. So, I mean, she was mentally, physically exhausted. And yet she'd get up in the break, go to the bathroom, come back, come recompose, sit down and, you know, had that warm charm about her. And, it and was all just, this, there's a man right there with a gun to her gun colleague's head. Right across yeah, right in the studio and she's in the newsroom and she, you know, and, and crazy things were happening. Like a SWAT team would be walking through the newsroom with big guns and it was just so unreal. And this is back in the day where you didn't have group therapy. You know, you didn't all sit down and try to recover or even think that you were affected by it. But at that point I knew I was engaged and I knew I wanted to have children. And I know when the first news ca- or the first news reports went out, they were talking about uh, the gunman had an assistant producer, and that wasn't entirely accurate. But that was my title, and it was, and they revealed that it was a woman. And I was just sure that my mom was listening and my fiance right. was listening. So we also didn't have cell phones. So I'm grabbing phones. Right, I was just going to say, I'm that. okay. You're going to hear about this, but I'm fine. I'm safe. You know, in a click. <gasps> so. Anyway, long story short, that's when I decided I want to have have children raised in a smaller community (laughs) because the next day we had bars on the doors. Everything was locked. I mean, it was the whole place was a different vibe. You know, up until that point, we were small town. We were working downtown and, you know, it was just common for us to look under our at after the 10 o'clock news, look under our cars to make sure nobody was asleep under there. You know, it wasn't the greatest part of town. And so All of that, I think, will never happen again. We'll never have that uh, naive look at the world after an experience like that. You'll never take things for granted that, that you're safe. And so while it's kind of sad, it really set me on a different course and um, a- another one that was fantastic and gave me even more opportunities where I could be doing stories for CNN and going places that few people could go to to bring back the news. I um, was with the Forest Service for a time. And so in that way, I was able, you know, I could go to mountaintops where they were moving by helicopter bighorn sheep. So the sight alone of that, the visual of these bighorn sheep dangling in a net from a helicopter over to another wilderness area, it was those kinds of images that I could bring back that few people could have access to. So that sent me in a whole different direction. And 
Um, eventually, you know, I, I was learned a lot of science, learned a lot of forestry, um, became a, a science reporter in a lot of ways and um, in a lot of venues. And it, it was just amazing. And from there, I've met, of course, incredible people. I was also, you know, in, in a small town. Uh, I don't know, Christina, if you've had this experience, but in a small town, you wear many hats. And so I was started a PR company. I was managing festivals. I was bringing big speakers in. And so just having access, it was, again, having access to these people that have done incredible things that have really enriched my life. And um, now at this point, I, looking back, I feel like I have learned so much from these incredible people, gleaned so many lessons. And I feel like I'm in a place where I can share that and really be of value to other people. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So you've taken everything that you learned from your 40 years in journalism and being a reporter, and now you're helping specifically women over a certain age really grab onto what you call their newsworthy story, like their newsworthy life and, and really put their best foot forward. So how does that work? Absolutely. Christina, you know, I feel like women's lives. And I know you've, I've heard you say this too, sort of different chapters in our lives. We can kind of slice them up and categorize. Okay. So in my teens, I was excited and wanted to learn everything and do everything in my twenties, you know, and, and so on. Right. So, so I feel like we've all learned so much and like you, I know you and some of your guests have talked about this, the workforce never seemed like the right time. I was always too young, looked too young, sounded too young. And then by the age of 27, I'm thinking I better have a plan B because I'm watching, you know, other anchor people, news women, um, starting to feel the pressure from the next up and coming, you know, few years younger. Uh, and, and it seemed like there was, it's kind of a cruel industry that way, or at least it was, I hope that I feel that that's changing. And I, and I know that, you know, by the time I was in my forties and fifties, I wish I could just turn around and talk to my younger self and say, Hey, you haven't even begun because by the time you're in your fifties, which I really feel like was the, the decade that my world opened up and that I could apply. I had the confidence. I had the expertise. I, uh, felt I can talk to anybody. I could go anywhere and feel comfortable. And I felt like I had a lot to share with other people so that maybe they could skip over some of the rough patches and land, you know, get there faster. But I really feel, you know, at at 50, in my 50s, I had as much energy, if not more, as much enthusiasm, if not more, certainly way more experience and confidence and very comfortable in who I am and what I do. You know, no longer intimidated or afraid to speak up or um, afraid I, you know, wasn't fitting in or worried about what a, somebody else thought, which, you know, that's that was a huge lesson for me for decades. You know, just don't worry about that. And just all these things that added up to a much stronger version of myself. And then realizing I had the power to create my life and be who I wanted to be. And it was nobody else's business, whether they liked it or not. (laughs) Isn't it great being in your fifties when you, all that starts to click and you're like, I don't care what anything anybody says. I don't really care if this doesn't work. I'm going to try it. And there's a lot of things I've tried. And then I've, you know, some things I've tried for years and years and they're finally coming to fruition that some things didn't, but it's like, but I tried and it's okay if it doesn't work because it might turn me in a different direction. Oh, it's so true. I don't think there's ever an example of something that you didn't learn something um, that you tried and maybe you didn't learn exactly or you didn't land exactly where you were hoping, but maybe you landed somewhere better. And yes, I, I totally agree. I just think there's so much life to be lived and I'm so inspired um, by older people now. I mean, I seek older women out because I want to hear their story and I want to be inspired by what they're doing now, what their next chapter is and, and what they have to offer. And so many of them, you know, it, it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. They don't even consider that they just live their best life. And oddly it, it makes them more powerful and more interesting. Um, I, so, so yeah, so what I've done 
recently is I've always taught uh, media relations workshops, mostly out of a necessity when I'd watch people really do badly (laughs) on a television interview or radio interview or something. And then I felt like, okay, I got to step in. I got to figure out how I can help folks. And it became a really popular thing. Um, I was teaching a lot of scientists and um, foresters and other outdoor individuals because primarily that wasn't their world. They would live, you know, they would work in labs or they'd work out in the wildlands and their lane was not public speaking. So helping them create their hook and their key messages and get a sound bite down to 30 seconds or less with a beginning, a middle and an end and being engaging and, uh, and not trying to control the message, you know, being relaxed and enjoying it and, um, and realizing that the news media is on your side, you know, reporters want you to look good because it makes them look good. Them look and so good. anything exactly. you can do to help them. Like I always tell people, think like a reporter, what are the elements that they need? Don't just expect that there's, it's their job to go research you and your area of expertise that you've been doing for 30 years, and then be really good about gleaning out those key messages, that's not going to happen. And you don't want to leave that up to anybody. You want to make sure that it's perfectly clear. It's not a mystery. It's clear what you're trying to talk about and uh, what you hope people take away. So that's the kind of thing I do today. I help people, um, mostly business women and mostly business women who are older because they're at a stage where they are doing their own thing. They're starting their own business. They're writing their own books. They're becoming a public speaker. They're, they're doing these things. They're, they're heading up an organization that puts them in a position of power. And so I want them to be, to be able to step into that visibility, to step into the spotlight with confidence and impact so that when they do, they're ready. And they can also inspire other women to do the same thing, to step up and have their story and share their stories. And, you know, when I walk into a room, Christina, you probably do the same thing. I walk in and I look for the most interesting person, the most interesting story. And it it usually doesn't fail me. I find, you know, it might not even be the keynote speaker. In fact, it may be the keynote speaker, but also these bonus people that are really interesting. And right. uh, often they're women that just have something about them. You know, they, they have a way about them. They have a confidence. They have a style. Um, and as you mentioned, the three things that I have kind of brought this down to, boiled this down to, is what makes people newsworthy is their story. It's a unique story. Everybody has one. It's crafting that story to make it compelling is really the trick. Um, their soul. I feel like our soul is really our core values, if you will. It's the reason why we do what we do. And that let, makes us want to trust and respect somebody. And it really helps us understand what their purpose is, what they're here for. And then style is the fun part. And that's how we show up. And it's how people recognize us. It's how they remember us. So story, soul, and style is are really three key things that I work on with people. And uh, I, I've had so many great examples of um, people that have all those things that have been in the spotlight, but shown up well in the spotlight. They may have been a world-class explorer, but they came in authentically with all those three things. Right. And it's so important. I have all of my clients do um, what I call their wow bio because like they're not, they don't realize people are afraid to have be their own megaphone. And I had a client once and she was a music therapist and a month into our working relationship, we're, we're going through things. And she's like, oh, yeah, I used to play with Frank Sinatra every Friday night. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, she's like, yeah, I went to Juilliard and Yale and played with Frank Sinatra and Bruce Springsteen. And, and again, she's a music therapist and she's a 25-year Reiki master. I said, maybe I should have known that at the beginning. Like, <laughs> So now I have everybody craft their wow bio because then you can, and I'm sure you do something similar with your clients, but that's how you get their, their wow, their story into, you know, two sentences where, especially for the media to look at it and go, wow, that's a story. Like, that's great. You have to have a hook. There's so much 
competition for people's attention. Yes. And you have to also realize who you're reaching first in, uh, let's just say uh, in television news, you're going through an assignment desk first. You're not reaching that reporter necessarily. There's lots of gatekeepers along the way and your target audience may be out here, but to get to them, you've got to go through these gatekeepers. So that's that's really key to know. And, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking in, in print media, we call that burying the lead. And so when someone does that to you, you're going, what? I had a woman that I was interviewing oh, about a year ago, and she is part of Child Help, which is an amazing story all in itself. They were part of the people that brought uh, the babies out of Vietnam and got them adopted. And these were babies that were uh, fathered in many cases by um, service, U.S. servicemen. So basically, they were kids that nobody that didn't really have a country. You know, they weren't really accepted where they were. So when the troops were getting out, all of a sudden the orphanages were were going to be left on their own. And so these women were actresses. They were actually with the USO, and they were out there entertaining the troops. They they arranged to have planes carry these babies out. So one of these ladies, and they're from old Hollywood, you know, things were classier and glamorous and prestigious. And so these lovely ladies who are every bit of first class, uh, it comes out during an interview that one of them dated Elvis. And I'm going, what? That'd have been fun to know. (laughs) know? Right? Right. That's so, why I do the wow bio. Exactly. Cause yes, I get that your wow come bio. Yeah. And, you, and sometimes you have to spill it and or pull it out of people. Yeah. The scientists, I find that all the time, Christina, oh my gosh, they have no idea that what they're doing is world-class changing lives. Right. You know, I mean, putting stuff on, ast- on, uh, on rocket ships that are going out somewhere. I mean, just crazy stuff. Um, I'll tell you. But to them, it's every day. Oh, uh, one of my favorite quick stories is that uh, when I was working with the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University, I was walking through this hall that's normally very, very quiet. It's got a lot of labs in it. And somebody was blasting Queen's We Will Rock You. I mean, blasting it. And I'm going, this is so out of character. So, of course, I had to go wander in and see what was going on. And it was an entomologist slab, which if you're not familiar with that, they are people who study bugs. And it was a forest entomology lab. And this was at a time when uh, the bark beetle was ravaging millions of acres across the West. And it was a huge problem. The, the ecosystems were out of balance. The trees were too, too uh, weak to push back. Anyway, so he was studying how to interrupt bark beetle behavior by blasting them with noise. And it was working. And oh, so I was just going to say, that's wow. Tough. So I, I'm like, Rich, you've got to let me, his, his name is Rich Hof, Hofstetter. I'm, I'm like, you've got to let me tell the world about this. So we did. We got lots of attention. I think um, the first story that came out was from USA Today. And it just, you know, it was ha- how you're blasting bark beetles with uh, with with rock music. Queen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with Queen specifically. So, you know, stories like that where you're going, how how are you not telling me about this? You know, you're a friend of mine right. and you don't tell me that you're doing this. And it's it's the kind of thing that people remember and they're talking about the next day. Right. But I think I think you're right. I think people don't realize that that's a good story. To them, no. it's like that's just what I do. There's no, there's no wow to that. <laughs> I know you just want to shake them and go, yeah. why are you not telling me this? Um, now, when you say style, do you, cause we've had a, a celebrity stylist on, but you, mm-hmm. you don't necessarily mean clothing. Well, like, that can be part of it. Is it your presence? Like your whole. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, I have a, uh, a friend who is, um, a yoga and Pilates, uh, instructor. She has her own studio. She, um, is absolutely amazing. And she shows up in really nice, uh, workout clothes. I mean, with a jacket, when she goes, when she's on camera, there's no question about what she does yet. It's very professional and she's very poised. And, um, she doesn't look like she just came out of a, 
hot yoga class. She just looks very elegant and very comfortable. And that seems very appropriate. That's what she does. That's how she lives. So, I mean, in some cases you want to look like, uh, what you do, or at least when people put it together, what you do, they're going, Oh yeah, of course, you know, you look, you, Christina, look like a television host, so hostess. So, of course, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, of course she is. So it's not any, it's not any surprise. But I also think of style as, um, and this goes back to kind of gets back to the soul part too. It, it shows you're, you're showing the world what's important to you. And that could be by what you're doing, who you're hanging out with, where you show up, um, who you give back to, uh, these, these sorts of things, you know, what do you do as a daily practice is, is the environment super important to you is, is religion super important to you? What is it? And, and that should kind of shine through in just clues or how you present yourself. Um, some people are bodybuilders and no matter what beautiful dress they've got on, they have these amazing arms <laughs> and you're just going, no need, no guessing here. You know, these people lift weights with a passion. And so you can kind of put it together. And I know there are really great expression experts out there who dress people for Ted talks so that it all gels. You can see the whole person and, and yes. And so style, yes. And, and it's the same thing when I tell people, I want to get them camera ready. It doesn't mean just how they look. It means how they talk and how they pause and how they um, behave and how straight they sit and, you know, all these things and how aware they are of their environment, no matter if people can see them or not, because I believe all these things get translated through microphones, whether you can see a person or not, or if, uh, you know, if you're on stage, um, you're in the audience, you can tell by the way somebody's body language is. We all know that. So we should be more aware of that. What, what messages are we putting out there? So be your best, you know, as, as often as you can. And, you know, I have fun, some fun stories. I have a book that's coming out right now and it's called uh, life lessons from a Zony girl. And I always have to explain it. I always think people get it. Zony is what Californians call us when we leave Arizona in August, when it's hot and humid and we go over and invade their beaches. So they call us Zonies. I thought it was cute. Not sure they think it's cute, but anyway, it's called uh, life lessons from a Zony girl, how to stay grounded, oh wait, sunny, grounded, and resilient. And it's a lot of the stories that I've learned over the years. It's, it's fun. Um, and I use the Arizona landscape as a metaphor for lessons learned and that sort of thing. So that's another thing I'm, I'm hoping to reach women, especially with, I think they can relate. I think that, uh, they can recognize things that aren't working for them. For example, I think a very common lesson that we all seem to learn, but mostly too much too late in our lives is that the people that we let into our heart, you know, the people that are closest to us are not necessarily on our side in everything that we want to do. They might be with us. And I think Joel Osteen said this, they, they may be with us, but they're not necessarily for us. So it's a kind of a fine line, but I think we've all let people in or let people too close to us that aren't necessarily good for us. They're not good for the way they talk to us or treat us or encourage us or don't encourage us. And so that's one of the lessons that I wish I had picked up on back in my teens. And that would have propelled me into a better place quicker, I believe. Um, but I think it, I think other women will go, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've seen that, that person, you know, I, I get that. I understand. And, and you feel like when you're reading this book, you feel like you're talking to a friend and, and I call it kind of a, I kind of a, I call, call it a trail guide. So a trail guide across your landscape, whether it's thorny or slithery or gravelly, you know, and, and kind of a soft leadership book, but it does feel like, you know, we're just friends and we're just talking it out. Yeah, and it sounds like almost leadership for your soul, like for you oh, particularly. I'm going to have to write that down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll use that. You're welcome. You <laughs> <laughs> no. I love it. Oh. So yeah, it's, no, it's, that's it's so fun and to talk be about. 
do an event when you bring people in, right? And you go through all of these steps to uh, shine. Is yeah, that right? the shine workshop. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, you know, in the past, I've done a lot of workshops that have been a day long or half a day or two days. But this time I felt it was really important in this chapter to bring people who are super serious. You know, a lot of times I've worked with organizations and people get sent to my workshop. You know, they're not necessarily there because they want to be. They have no interest in it. They just get sent by HR. So now I put this on. I'm not representing anybody. I'm not going to organizations, although I might. Um, but I want women who really want to be there. I want women who are hungry for their best life. And I want them to be able to go someplace. Uh, the, the most recent workshop was in Sedona. Go someplace that's kind of tucked away, that's beautiful, so inspirational, where we can enjoy the landscape. We can do yoga on the rocks. We can have a star party with the amazing dark skies. We can really relax and open our minds. Um and, and also, you know, practice, practice, practice being on camera and honing our skills and, and then, and then going ahead and doing it for real and, uh, and then celebrating at an amazing restaurant and having all this available to us where we're not, where we've told, you know, we've arranged for our kids to be taken care of or our grandkids to be taken care of or whoever we're taking, you know, we're in, a, in our lives that, that we don't have to worry about it. We can turn off all our electronic devices, at least during the day or until we have breaks. Then we can really focus on us because that's one thing I find that women, that's we're always in our last place. And I even know that from exercise. You know, I'm the first one to take myself off of my own schedule about what's good for me so that I can fit somebody else's important matters in. And I know we all do that. So, so that is my true goal now is really to take people away, give them an amazing experience that lets them dream and visualize and, and level up, you know, if you will elevate who they are and be their best or put themselves on that trajectory with whatever that looks like. And then what, what, uh, kind of the, the bonus out of that is you're with a lot of amazing other women who have either done what you're doing or get what you want to do and encourage you. When we did this, we were in the house for five days. It was an epic snowstorm. I had all these outdoor events planned and it was a snowstorm that just kept coming from the moment we got there to the last day, the last day the sun came out. And so, but it was cool because when we came, we became almost like a little family. We we're all together. We had the yoga instructor that I was telling you about, we had all these mats. We're doing that. We were going out, you know, in four wheel drive vehicles to dinner. And we, and, and the women who didn't know each other were like borrowing each other's clothes and practicing thing. You know, some people would bring, um, mirrors or, or lights that would create that ring. And, and one was a influencer. And so, you know, we were practicing each other's social media and, and, and it became us our true sisterhood. Then we had ping pong in my bedroom <laughs> so, I mean, and, and so much food. Um, and so that's, you know, you create something that you know is good and then, you know, because you bring the right people together and somehow that happens magically, that it's going to be even better that you'll have outcomes that you couldn't have dreamed of. Oh, that's great. That's great. I can't believe our time is up. I could talk to you forever. Oh, this um, was so much fun. So we wrap up the, the episodes with the same two questions. Uh, what is the greatest thing you've accomplished since you've turned 50? Well, I have to say the greatest thing I accomplished since I turned 50 um, bumped me into this new area of my life. And that was uh, feedback from the world. I was all of a sudden getting awards that I was that were really meant something. I got my Emmy Award for a documentary about um, forest fires of the West, and it was aired on uh, PBS stations across the West and at forestry conventions, and it won an Emmy. And so that was huge. And that was at a time, a real low point in my life where I felt like, you know, I had nothing to give and I'd really silenced my voice and I was becoming, um, just with just disappearing basically on my own accord, just because it was a really rough patch in my life. I had three of my closest relatives, my oldest sister, oldest brother, and my mom 
all dying at the same time from fatal diseases. And it wasn't like they were all sick with the same thing or in a car accident that made sense. So anyway, it was a really tough time for me. And I kept, you know, feeling myself fade away. Things weren't beautiful to me. The sunsets that I love, I didn't even care. I didn't even look at them. I wasn't listening to music, things that inspire me. I didn't care about, didn't care about food. You know, you can tell you're not yourself and my world didn't look familiar to me. And then I didn't look familiar to me. And so when I got this feedback and I got, um, received, you know, applause and people telling me that I really did have something to give. And I really was, you know, they wanted to congratulate me as a writer, you kind of work in your own little world. You're not getting a lot of feedback. A lot of times you're kind of isolated. And if you're on the radio or uh, on TV, you're just talking to a camera or, or through a microphone. So you're not necessarily getting all that feedback when people, you know, uh, really appreciate what you're doing. So that was momentous to me. And then I, I took, I did an intervention on myself because I realized I was needing an intervention. So I sent myself to surf camp and that was, wow. that was at age 52. I was the oldest person in the class and, um, probably got the most out of it. Um, it's kind of funny because my more religious friends said, I missed the message, you know, cause I said, I don't know why, but I feel like I have to go surf. And they were saying, no, no, no. The message is go serve. <laughs> so, oh, sir. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, yes. Uh, and then where do you see yourself in 10 years? Well, in 10 years, you know, I'm super excited because uh, I feel like I've gotten to this place where I really can create my own world. And uh, I hope to be writing novels. You know, I've written a lot, a lot, a lot. That's what I do every day is write. But I'd like to write novels and screenplays. And I'd love to be on more stages and um, just really excited about uh, what is yet to come. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And where can people find you? You can find me at bonniestevensarizona.com. I also have a podcast. I call it a vodcast because it's a video podcast and it's called Zoni Living Business Adventure and Leadership. And it's at uh, starworldwidenetworks.com. You can find me there. So those are the best places. I'm also on Instagram. But if you put Bonnie Stevens and Arizona together, you're going to find me. I'll find you. Awesome. And we'll have everything in the show notes too. So thank you, Bonnie. It was so great spending this time with you. Great to spend time with you, Christina. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for listening or for watching this episode of Living Ageless and Bold. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit subscribe. And if you like the episode, I hope that you will give us a great review. You can also head over to livingagelessandbold.com and sign up for information, inspiration, and exclusive opportunities for us, women over 55. Thanks for listening. And remember, no matter what you do, keep living ageless and bold.